It's Pocket Panther. He doesn't get tired. The Pocket Panther? Yeah, he's like a little bangle Asian leopard cat. But, he, dude, he got in a fight with Kyle. It's lost part of his tail. And he's still good. Like, yeah, those, those he's cats. all good, ready to go. Dude, I have two cats that we found. Um, and we're talking about cats. We're talk, We're starting out the conversation, if you guys can't tell. In the background, you hear the cat going, so it's just going to be kind of one of those things. Um, but I, um, my cats, dude, they're six years old. They're they're barn cats, and they're brutal, dude. They'll they'll kill everything and bring them in, and and uh, I mean they're awesome because we, uh, if we didn't have them, we'd have so many rats around here, right? I and, buy my dog food by the pallet, and it just stays down in the basement. No, it's just like out. And I live on a farm. There's mice all over, but since he's down there in the basement, there's like absolutely no mice touch my dog food. So. They're brutal. He can be annoying and stay. It's fine with me. Yeah, I mean, I, me too. And and he'll he'll realize. Well, I'll, I'll I don't know anything I'm talking about when it comes to cats, but I mean, he's doing better now. So, Jason, how are you, man? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Doing good. You and I just met earlier today. I met because Derek spoke of you when I did a live stream with him yesterday, and you you were one of the presentations at his event lately. Yeah. Yeah, I did a little bit of talking about mainly like early development stuff with puppies. Also, uh, I did some talking about like the bond that needs to happen with every dog, uh, but also with uh, LGDs, especially. <coughs> what up, um, Teresa? Teresa's yeah, here. Hi, Teresa. She's the and one that made this thinking? happen. Yep. She's our, she's our connector. Mm-hmm. We love you. I love her, man. She's, she's an awesome person. And I and that's what seminar. Well, and um, Derek and I were talking about like we need people with the subset of talents in th- that we bring into this fold, you know. Right, right. And and you were get out of here, dude. Get <laughs> sorry, you got a dog that I just made a coffee drink. And um, oh, by the way, this is that coffee. So they have this canned powder. I'm not spewing for Starbucks unless they want it. They can sponsor me if they want. <laughs> but it's like this powder roast and you can yeah. make the strongest dang coffee with this stuff like you got to be careful like panic attack that's where i like coffee. my coffee if you can't Me too, if you, dude. you're not holding on to something after you drink it it's no good not... <laughs> like dog gives me some, my wife will make me one and i'll be like oh man give me the can yeah <laughs> yep. let me dump more so um yeah that's I'm what that's shoot. what she does uh i want to be able to yeah, hair on my chest, but but no grounds or any of that crap. I don't want any of that. Right. Um, what what I was saying about Teresa was like I, we we have problems in the dog world that we can bring people in that are used to solving problems, but we also have, and what we'll talk about today is like a a big, um, wide breadth of history that we have with dogs that I think people have like really really are ignorant of. And when I say ignorant, they're just basically ignoring uh, it, right? Ignore right. it, right? And I want well, to talk about a lot of stories that are just made up to sell like a certain breed, you know. Or and it's all these feel good stories, and you know the lassies, or you know, and I'm sure that some of them are are definitely you know intention well, but the road to hell is paved with the best intentions, you know. So uh, <laughs> correct, I like correct. I like sticking with truth. Oh, dude, share this since you're on your phone. Um, here I'll I'll tag you if you'd like, or I just we do, we just became friends on Facebook. But everybody, while you're oh, listening, uh, share this if you don't mind. And then Bow Wow Bill is my page, Jason. And uh, yeah, I sent to- it to some people that I already like knew would want to watch it. And then now okay. I'll just share it to my actual Facebook page. Yeah, share it, man. Let's get as many people that know you as possible that uh, can make fun of you and make me laugh. They're really good at that. Really good at that. <laughs> but no, I, I I was looking forward to chatting with you, and um, and so let's let's start at the beginning, man. How did you get started with dogs? Well, okay, so I've always like liked dogs i was one of those kids that like you know uh if i was allowed to pick out a book it was the uh, akc even though i'm against them now uh like it was their little book on like every single dog you know and i try to find these dogs when i was out you know and find like specimens of them and back then in like the you know the 90s and stuff dogs were being ruined obviously but uh they weren't as bad off as they are now it's a little bit easier to find some dogs and so like i had these pictures in my head 
of like all these dogs that I wanted. And then uh, I also like my first job was at a dog kennel. Uh, okay. I was like 12 or 13, you know, just like scooping shit, you know, just doing the dog kennel thing. Uh, I worked in dog daycares and all sorts of stuff. Um, I think some of the time that I've learned the most about dogs was being homeless with a dog. Um, I was doing a lot of traveling and a lot of like, you know, homeless by choice, I guess you'd say type thing. Uh, riding freight trains, hitchhiking, you know, sleeping here and there, living in national forests, going to hippie festivals, all sorts of stuff, but always with a dog, you know? And so like, you're sitting in, working out we call it working out yeah yeah it's total looking dude. total looking <laughs> like straight up <laughs> but uh you know and i was also do like but i was using these dogs for companion and stuff like that but also as like security you know and uh never really training obedience or anything like that just because it just happened it was like a fluid thing that happened with these dogs and so therefore like there wasn't a ton of commands. It was just like a routine all the time. You know, this dog was like learning agility, jumping on a train, like learning how to be good because like he was a service dog. You know what I mean? Like things like that, like sneaking my dogs around and stuff, they had to be good. Uh, but I didn't really read anything about like how to train a dog or anything like that. It kind of just was like what worked, which is like what we talked about actually just earlier when we had our little conversation before we did this is like, I think that people did better with their dogs back in the day because they didn't have the internet, man. And they didn't have books and they didn't have some idiot or someone really smart that just was like above their head telling them like, this is how trained dog. This is how a dog should be. This is this, this is that. And like before people could read and write, they had dogs, man. They've been with us since the beginning of time. You know what I mean? Like we have, we're together in this like world and us and dogs, which is it's been awesome. in fact, it's been argued we wouldn't exist where we are as a civilization without no. the help of our, our four legged friends, man. No, because just like you, they, they provide that extra set of ears and eyes. But just like what we're going to talk about too, the LGDs or livestock guardian dogs, the ones that allowed us to go from a, uh, you know, um, what do you call it when you, when you, uh, nomadic when you're nomad right you were you were nomad by choice but meaning right. that we, you go from place to place to place that, that allowed us to go from a nomadic existence to a horticultural pastoral existence by and 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 not only that but leveraged us to the capability of having numbers of livestock that were sustainable to to grow a society because of them because right. they, they can herd and help us and had like you, they could herd them. They could keep, you know, like keep an eye on them. One guy can only keep an eye on so much and can only run off so many predators and stuff like that. But yeah, exactly. Like once we started, well, not even started. I don't think. I think we we started at the same time. Uh, but once maybe that relationship got better or however it happened, I don't know. No one probably knows for sure. But uh, it allowed us to, like you said, have more, you know, and uh, and have that more be secured by more than just one person. I mean, even today, uh, you could hire five security guards that all like are sitting on their phones and dicking around and whatnot. And like someone's robbing them, but like dogs don't take days off. Dogs don't have cell phones. Dogs walk in like two different worlds at once, you know, like they, they, they understand like so much more than we do <clears throat> because they're not so confused, you know? Yeah, sure. We've confused the shit out of dogs. Don't get me wrong. But at the same time, dogs aren't like as confused with the world. Like they don't have a watch, you know what I mean? Like things like that, like they're doing them, you know? Yeah. Um, so- well, And check I, this it, out, Dave, too. <coughs> Jeez Louise. Can you see this? Yeah. I love herding dogs. I think one of my favorite herding dogs is Kelpies. I totally. We got a lot of Australian fans. If you're having too. a tough day at work. Take a break for a second. Yeah, watch. I'll just. Isn't that cool, dude? Yeah. And that's. I don't know who this dude is, but I thought it was just going to be drone footage of the. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Never be anywhere without people. Uh, but yeah, so you know, and then so I, I learned a lot about dogs then, and also learned about like security of a dog and stuff like that. And then also, uh, 
you know, so then I kind of came back to the cities and stuff like that. And I started working at like dog daycares. Um, I worked at like a place where people bathe their own dogs. That was a joke. Um, but uh, then I started kind of getting a little bit more like wanting to be more like professional in it. And uh, I went to dog massage school, which doesn't, didn't take a very long time, but I learned like dog massage. So you learn like all the anatomy and all that kind of stuff. And then you also learn like the techniques of massage and some physical therapy stuff as well. Um, then I kind of found out that the, the, what you were dealing with with that like was more so like the type of uh, just not something I really wanted to get into just for various reasons, more the people. Um, but then I just kind of just owned dogs and we moved out here to the farm and I realized like I need a guard dog. Uh, I need a, a livestock guardian dog, a farm guardian dog, you know, a dog that's going to do it, kind of do it all uh, independently. And I started looking into these breeds that I knew about and started noticing they're all kind of ruined uh, in, or they just don't work out. They don't have the human aggression that you would need living close enough to a city, but far enough out that you're still kind of like a target, things like that. So I settled on the Tibetan Mastiff um, and I really, really liked them. But I realized like they're doing the breed a very, very di like a big disservice, right? And so like they're by the mm -hmm. the show the show breeding and without taking away their working abilities and adding in some crosses and like I'm all about crosses. Don't get me wrong. People in the Tibetan Mastiff world hate me for it, but it's needed because there's so much lost in like the structure, the behavior, you know, yada yada yada. Not to mention that since the beginning of time. If Bill Church was coming down the road and Jason Kessler was coming down the road and we both had very tight family lines and uh, you had a really good male and I was like, wow, all right, cool. Well, that will allow me to put that into my dogs and then go tightly back into my family lines again. It's been going on since the beginning of time. The only thing that ruined this is communication between people. You know what I mean? Like, oh, inbreeding and oh, blah, 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 and the crossing, and blah, 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 blah. you know, and that's like a whole, we could go on for like a whole nother podcast on that. It's oh, really not, it's not even important. We're drowning in an information, ocean of information sometimes, like a lot of this exactly. stuff is exactly. tried and true, right? And we got to remember, and that's what we were talking about, like this stuff goes way back to a time that was way before a lost time, man. Like They're never there weren't even breeds back then it was just types and each breed, each type had its own subtype for the region it was in and then each one had a family for the family that bred it and then it became you know later on maybe castles you know and that's a big jump in history but like those dogs right there everybody wants to say oh this is a this this is a king corso this is a neo this is a uh uh a go um you know, some Middle Eastern breed or some this or some that. Like, no, it's nothing. It's just the original big guard dog. Hmm. And and it only became a breed really once like people got stuck in one place. You know what I mean? Like so Right. Well, and that's how they that's how like like that's how we started to understand genetics. That's how we understand I mean it's um what we call eugenics, right? Which is, it's a project right. that 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 what people start to, but that didn't come until what the later part of the uh, 16th century, I believe. It's when we really started to get into. I mean, that was when the first dog show in history was, was I believe in Brussels, Belgium, in 1590, right? And so. Ah. But it's also, but that's, but that's been a long time since this is, is we're talking about Assyrian, Sumerian, Babylonian, you know, the, the, the dawn of civilization, the, the Fertile Crest, Mesopotamia. And this is, right. this is, this was the dawn of civilization, right? This is, and guess who, guess who we have depictions of in our, in our art. And I'll show a couple more um, as we go along here, but um, I'll, I'll see if I can find them as well. Well, and, and also, too, is so like, uh, you know, in the LGDs, just like just they're, they're all the basically the same dog. They're just regionally different. And once people got stuck in one area due to, you know, wars or whatever the case may be, it became a national breed, you know. Mm -hmm. And so like for anybody to really claim anything that it's their nation's dog is like, OK, cool. That's your nation's subtype of the dog. You know what I mean? They all. <coughs> that would be like a. I mean, that would be what we would 
call what would you say that breed if, if you were to to depict the breed today what would you say that would look like i mean i know it isn't that i don't what, know how to pronounce it i think like is it like pesh pesh dar or something it's like some sort of kurdish dog oh, it no looks good. very similar to that but i mean that but to say that is almost like an atrocity <laughs> uh, well it looks like mastiff to me you know yeah yeah no it's definitely a molosser that's what i'm saying is like so back back then uh it was just a molosser you know and like it was it was created uh and uh it was i'm trying to figure out what this dog's name is and it drive me nuts <laughs> there goes the cat yeah old pocket <laughs> panther he's a nutball <laughs> Um, you know, it, it doesn't, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what that dog's name is. Uh, but so, you know, that, that, that back then, um, I'm sure that like, there's a million people that will say, okay, it's this. Okay. It's that. Okay. It's that. But yeah. See, so like, even oh, right look, here, they're, they're comparing it to a Spanish Mastiff, you know, the same exact thing. And like the Spanish Mastiff wasn't around then, you know, that wasn't even near the yeah, where that Sphinx. dog is. Sphinx as a dog or was a dog, the structure is there. I don't know, man. I think the Sphinx, I, I'm getting comments here down on this other, my Twitter feed too. Join us on Twitter as well. I got it on my iPad down below um, here. But um, that's, uh, the Sphinx, I think, is maybe the pose. But what do you think? Do you think the Sphinx might have depicted a dog? I, I a comment. I've never thought about it, to be honest with you. Um, I do know that they have dogs and some of the depicted dogs, you know, uh like something that someone today would call like a pharaoh hound um you know uh those are depicted quite a bit in uh, in egyptian stuff and actually i think oh no i don't have that in here uh, i have like a carving that's got some egyptian stuff and it looks more like a sight hound uh that you would see today but as far as the sphinx goes i don't i think that that was more like meant to be a lion or something wasn't it interesting but yeah, keep the comments coming, man. I mean, like um, you said, we never we never considered it, and I love, I love the you know the process of of considering stuff. <laughs> you know? I know we're kind of going like all over the place here, but there is one point I wanted to make about like having experience um, in dogs prior to becoming a breeder, um, because like I do breed dogs, right, and so uh, I breed. Tibetan Mastiffs. I also have done, like, started an outcrossing uh, to bring back some things into them and whatnot. But uh, so, like, before you can become a doctor, right? Before you can become a heart specialist, you have to do, like, your internship at a, at a, at a hospital, right? Most of the time at, like, an emergency room. And, like, that's because breeding is, like, a, you know, a free for all type thing. That's not a requirement. You don't have to have any sort of special skills to become a breeder. You just have to know that a male and a female make babies and you can sell them. Uh, and so, like, I think that that's something that's kind of lost in time. So this kind of connects back to what we're talking about is, like, not everybody really was a breeder back then, you know. And, like, now, like, dog man is, like, a self-titled thing that everybody wants to say, like, oh, I'm a dog man. And a friend of mine actually the other day was, like, you're not a dog man unless other people are calling you a dog man. You know, like you can't say like, I am a dog man. It's like that guy is a dog man. You know what I mean? And so like back then it was a very like prestigious thing to be a dog man, to be in charge of breeding these animals that were like so useful to us. And now that's all just been kind of thrown away. And uh, you've got breeders breeding dogs that don't even know anything about like the dog, let alone mm -hmm. that dog or how to feed that dog or how to train that dog or any of that kind of stuff. Like they don't know all of this stuff about dogs. They're no, like they're not, they don't know anything really. They just know that like dog, you know, dog sex equal money, you know? And that's about, and so it, it's just, I don't know with the whole history changing in dogs is really like it's across the board. It's just kind of ruined things in my opinion, you know, like I'm not saying the dog is all the way ruined. Dogs are still like magical, man, like super magical, like one of the most magical things on earth. But at the same time, a lot of that magic is dying. You know, well, it's, a lot it's of, being forgotten. It's being forgotten yeah. collectively by the American psyche or by the world psyche. And, and, um, but mostly, I mean, in, in America and, and, uh, 
because I think that the, the role of the dog has ch changed dramatically in the last hundred years, you know, and these people, like I was saying to you, was it you who I was talking about the looking at dogs? Yeah. Like, yeah, like, yeah. The, like you walk into somebody's house and you go into the, the bathroom and they got looking at towels, you know, you're not supposed exactly. to use those towels, use the towel right here. Those are decorations, right? Yeah. And I'm like, that's what these dogs are akin to, man. It's like looking at dogs, like these dogs have purpose. And, and even though the role has changed, the purpose and that, that uh, drive and, the, and the, the wants and desires of this animal are still, are still valuable. And that's why I've traded my life to, to help educate people about it. And I often tell people, like, I'm an attorney for the dog. I represent their, their best interests, right? You're calling me because the, the, this relationship has gotten up under the ditch somewhere. You know, and, right. and 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 that's where I come in, and and that's what I want to fulfill is that dog, and and look at well, that the relationship is something that's lost. You What's know, that? The relationship, the relationship is something that's lost, and that uh, it, with people and their dogs, like that bond is like you know, obviously yes, people still have bonds with their dogs, but it's not like on a working relationship, and also sometimes it's like a forced bond like this like fake you know like like almost like some people have bonds with their kids nowadays it's like totally fake you know what i mean and like Surface. kids might not notice it but a dog notices that they notice you being fake you know what i mean and like they're gonna act out because of that you know and and if people bonded with their dogs more and like based everything on a bond rather than like treats and you know things like that they're going to get the dogs that are doing it because they're doing it for you. And they're doing, you know, which we'll, you know, I guess we'll probably talk about that a little more when we get into the LGD stuff. <laughs> but like, well, I, you know. while we're talking about it right now, Jason, when I, I, I just, I just remember this lady, I was walking with her in my field and I, and I just remember saying to her, you need to bond with that dog. And then she turned to me and she says, what, what do you mean? And so what do you, I'm going to turn to you and I'm going to ask you the same, like, and I just sat there for a second. I'm like, shit, man, it's esoteric to me almost. Like, I don't really know how to, how to explain to yeah. somebody else. Do you know what I'm saying there? Like, I'm, like I was like, I was perplexed right there. I was like, I don't know how to put this into words. It's like an, on a spiritual level. It's on the soulful level to me. Well, and that's the same thing that I would say too, is that like, Sure, I could teach you some things to do with your dog, or I could tell you things that I do with my dogs, but that might not necessarily carry over to like something you could do with your dog. Um, same as like if it doesn't have meaning, the dog's going to see it right away, anyways, and see it as totally fake anyway. Um, mm -hmm. But it's like for the bot, like I do. That's a really good question, to be honest with you, because like, see? <laughs> dude, I just so stopped me in my tracks, man. Yeah, it's so, and that I guess too is like that's why there used to be something called a dog man, because like he was able to do that without even being able to explain it, and just be like, I don't know, man. The dog just sits when it when I stop. You know what I mean? And like he just does because I have this connection with dogs that you might not have. And maybe you shouldn't own a dog and you should let me do the dog thing, you know? And but like nowadays, everybody has to have a kid. Everybody has to have a dog. Everybody has to have this. Yeah. And uh, but uh, as far as like the I mean, I guess the, the bond is really just a, a, if you really did want the dog and you show the dog that you want it and respect it and that you guys are on the, like a working even if you're not working the dog but you guys have like a working relationship here uh you know kind of like a give and take type deal um spending time with the dog you know listening to the dog uh you know that's the bond i don't know if that makes any sense to someone that doesn't already just feel like a bond is a natural thing with a dog well but, i'm going to ask everybody that's listening to you guys i'm going to go to the comments here pretty soon put in your comments if you have anything we already have one a bond is easier felt than explained that's a great one frank you know because but that's what i was thinking it's like and that's where we have the logic and emotion right and that's the right and left hemispheres of the brain and when we look at esoteric knowledge and the goal of that is the merging of the ma the masculine and the feminine and and uh so that there might be like a feeling aspect to this not just a thought or not just like there has to be so the question is if anybody's joining us is like how do you bond with your dog or how do you explain what that is to somebody that might not know what you're talking about because somebody asked me and i did not know i, I, I also think 
I also think too that especially like in my type, right? So LGDs, um, there have been dogs that it, that the bond has been bred out of them on purpose, right? Because we want like, them independent, right? Right, 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 right. But we don't understand that we want them independently doing what we want them to do, and that's something that we miss, right? So like you've got these dogs that are wanting this bond with people, and I think the dog understands the bond more than the human does. So that might be why we don't know how to explain it. Um, but, you know, at the same, and it, I guess the same is like bonding with your kids too, is like, you know, you just do things with them and it'll, it'll happen. You know what I mean? Um, and so uh, anyway, so we've got these dogs that are supposed to like, you know, don't touch them, don't bond with them, don't do this, don't do that, uh, just let them do, they know what they're supposed to do. And it's like, mm, nah, not really, because these dogs have been with us since the beginning of time, and now all of a sudden we want to change them. Because like in you know Western Europe and in the US, we're the only people in the whole world that raise livestock the way that we do. You know, like we're the only ones that don't live. Like if you're a shepherd and you're raising sheep, that's what you do. It's not like a hobby on your five acres, right? Like you're moving with these sheep. You're defending them with your dog. You know, you're doing all these things with your dog. Your dog isn't doing it for you. And uh, and so we've bred dogs trying, and I don't think we've ever even really gotten there too much. I mean, there's sure there's some that'll do it. But we're trying to get this dog, this magical dog that's like, I don't think it exists without the human, just like we don't exist without them, uh, to just go out and like bond with sheep. Like I was telling you about like the dog A and B with the coyote thing. I don't know if you want me to, you know, yeah, use that. Let's go, let's go into it because I wish that we recorded our conversation earlier because we've just touched on some great stuff. So you know, bonding with, and this, this goes right in, it dovetails nicely to the subject that we're talking about. So if you, if you wouldn't mind. Um, okay. So on that. expansion on like what I just talked about, about like bonding with your LGD is like, so let's say that we have like two clones of dogs. They're exactly the same dog. Right. And you have like dog a who has the bond and all of the training and like all that kind of stuff. You're setting your expectations of what you want them to do and everything like that. And then you have like, go live with goats. I feed you with a feeder. I never touch you. I never do anything like you're just a dog who goes out there. Right. Mm -hmm. So a coyote for the first time comes into both of their pastures, both dogs kill the coyote. Right. Both, and this is two separate coyotes, two separate things. I hope that this is making sense. And so dog a gets hurt by the coyote still wins. Everything's safe and lays next to the coyote you know, waiting for morning to come. Dog B, same exact thing, fights coyote, gets hurt, kills coyote, lives to tell about it, lays next to the coyote. Dog A in the morning, sun comes up, guy comes outside. Hell yeah, good job, dude. You got that coyote. You know what I mean? Like you're getting extra steak. Let me clean your wounds. You know, put some blue coat on you. We got you covered. You know, you, you know, you're the best dog ever. And he can feel that you like, you know, you're cause you're bonded with him and everything too is like, he feels how like proud of him you are. Right. Well, dog That's B, yeah. right. Exactly. Dog B, you just come out, take that coyote and I'll let you explain your other part too, is you take that coyote and just throw it in the burn pile and that's it. And then dog B just is like all hurt and you know, he's still got goat shitting in his food and all that kind of stuff. And then now we go to the next night. Here comes another coyote into both their pastures. Who's going to be the one that wants to jump up and get that coyote? The one that still is all wounded up and didn't get any respect for it and got his prize taken away with nothing and then goat, goat shit all over his food or the one that got the steak and the wounds licked and all that praise and everything like that. I, I'm no expert, but I think dog A is going to be the one that's going to want to do it even more. Dog B might go, <laughs> go ahead, dude. They've been shitting in my food all week. You know what I mean? Like, I don't care. I killed your buddy and I'm all hurt and I'm just laying here. So uh, I think that, that there's like one of like a million reasons why you should bond with your livestock guardian dog, because they're going to do the job. They're going to do it better with a bond than they would if you were just like, eh, here's the food, kid. You know, well, you know, and they did that experiment with rats where they built this utopia. And what they found out was that, that everything provided for these dogs, you know, without the necessary um, 
you know, means of, of gaining what, what we call purpose, right? right. That, that the behavior starts to begin, become very erratic and very violent. And the, 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 the pregnant, uh, uh, rats when it when it carried a term and if they did they discarded their 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 babies and the, the males got very violent not just towards the threats but also towards each other and the, you know whatever else it just became very spooky and, and basically what i think you're saying is is you're you're instilling that purpose with that dog right you're yep. you're, you're you're highlighting hey man this is real and that's what i call real positive reinforcement because look dude this is something that you did and I'm freaking really proud of you, man. Like, yeah, like you know, and and, and there's a there's we're sacks of chemicals, like you said. The dog knows differences in our in our changes in our body chemistry when we're surprised. That's all I was saying. Is like that surprise of like, oh, whoa, and then that that like because every day we would have a routine of walking out in that field, no coyote there, doing our chores, feeding those, you know, maybe petting that dog, feeding them as well. But then our routine would change as soon as we, whoa. Oh my goodness! Are there any more? We would walk around, maybe go get our gun, right, and right. Then walk around, and and but but we would have that dog right next to us. Come, good dog, come right next to me, man. Oh my gosh, good dog! Like and and so, I mean, it, it would be a whole. I mean, it it would be a part of giving the dog worth and purpose by showing them without a doubt, dude, you did the right thing, and you're where you belong, and and I'm I'm thankful that you're here, you know. Right. So. And I want to run into comments, like I said I would, about this bonding thing before we go. Um, so, so let me see here. I'm going to go down here first um, to Twitter, maybe. If I, can. I think Sometimes. one thing that you should touch on, though, just before I forget, it doesn't have to be right this second, is those downfalls you were telling me about the coyote oh, yeah. or the, the dog with dog B. Right. So dog B, not only will the dog start, the, dog, the dog's reward becomes the kill. Right. And so when you start come and take that reward, guess what? You become a threat as itself. Right. And so that bonding, it, 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 you you now become a confrontation for that animal. And now you have a choice if you go to grab that carcass of that coyote and that dog is like, dude, what are you doing? You know, and, and so the dog is not. I mean, I, I explained it a little bit different, but I think I'm getting the gist of what I was saying. Oh, no, yeah, you totally you are. Know? Because the and dog doesn't trust you and doesn't doesn't know that. You know, you're going to be, the dog is going to be compensated with steak or whatever. We don't want you eating this coyote. We don't want you getting the parasites or whatever that might be in this other predator. Um, but we, we want you to be compensated, right, for a job right. well done. Right. And the next coyote might not, you might not be able, if he does kill it, you might not be able to get it back, period. And you might not be allowed back in the pasture again. Because now he knows what he's supposed to be doing. I'm here to guard you know, from these things, I, I kill things that come into my pasture because yeah. I did it, not because you wanted me to, because I did it. Now you're not coming in here. And we need to show them, dude, I, you kill things in this pasture because I want you to. Exactly. Exactly. And, and how do we show them that? Right. And so I, I sometimes ask people if they can name one species of a tree, shrub or plant in their yard. Most, oh wait, whatever. Disconnect from nature. Okay, I, I totally, <laughs> that was the wrong uh, thread, I guess, I read from. But um, let me see, I'll, re I'll read from this one here. This is the first time reading this one. So, uh, like I was saying earlier, it's um, it's not forced, it happens naturally. Oh, here we go. Uh, it's felt rather than explained. That's Frank. Uh, the bond is a spiritual connection with your dog. That's how I see it as well. That's And it's esoteric, it's felt, man. I feel... Just like my girl, like I have a dog right here. I have dogs all over the place here, man. Like, and they're they're just they're here. I'm here. We're sharing the same space energetically, and it's a beautiful thing. Um, it's almost like when someone says they never know the love of parenthood, dude. And you were talking about how the the child doesn't might not know it, but the dog does. And I think that the child might not know it now and will adapt right? The adaptive child, that's what we call it. But that's right. what we call, that's what we call childhood wounds later on. And that's where like codependent behavior, you know, all this weird personality stuff might show up with, with human beings. And it's all traced back to guess what the parents, right? Um, exactly. It's not forced. It happens naturally. Yeah. 
I have a Jason Kessler, and he is wonder, working wonders with the TM Reed. I have a these Jason. are a couple that most of these people are people that I had sent it to before. I just my, shared it just now on my uh, my personal page or whatever. People always I advise. I say placing dogs with livestock. Uh, with limited shepherd farmer interaction, no, no, no. Always bond to owner first. Do you, well, you agree? And, oh yeah, for sure. So like I, I tell people, uh, you know, bond routine expectations, and uh, with the bond, I think that you know it's created while you're doing these routines and stuff with the dog, and it also is showing the dog like what's normally supposed to be going on, so that way anything like out of routine shows this dog like what the hell's going on you know what i mean uh so they're going to kind of get a little freaked out go out there and check it out and let you know um and then expectations you can't communicate your expectations to a dog without having a bond to start that communication level anyways you know so like bond and communication go hand in hand in my opinion um and you're communicating to the dog what you expect this dog to do or not to do in certain situations that happen during your routine um, and so like, I always say, you know, bring the dog up by the house, like right, like we were saying earlier in our conversation is, uh, this dog is a working dog. He's going to get hurt. You know, he's going to have to be in a crate at some point, you know, um, he's going to have to be on a leash at some point. He's going to have to do these things. You don't want the first time for these things to happen with this dog to be like when he's hurt to go in a crate and try to tear his way out of the crate when he's supposed to be laying down, chilled out, you know, you don't mm -hmm. want the first time you have to leash him is to bring him somewhere you have to go with him or, you know, to even bring him from one place to another on your own property. And he's like, you know, doing the wild horse thing. Uh, you know, all these, all these things need to be set in place at a young age. So that way, and they're smart, dude, LGDs are smart. You can show them a picture one time. And th then like a year later, be like, Hey, remember this leash? Like, it's no big deal. We got to use it to go here. You know, um, like, Bog dog, when I brought him to the little seminar thing, like I literally went out in the pasture and pulled him out of the pasture. He'd been there for months, uh, you know, obviously coming in and out of the kennel and stuff like that and like hanging out with me. But like he hadn't been anywhere off the property. And I threw him in the back of an SUV and drove out to the suburbs. And then he was like in a facility, like in a little crate for a little while. And then like walking around in the back and stuff like that. And it was just like, Meh, whatever, because I've done this when I was young, you know. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember this. That's what they're thinking, man. They're just exactly. Like, oh. They're just like, oh, yeah, nothing bad happened last time. Instead of like, what the hell's going on? I'm three years old. I've never been in a crate. I'm hurt. And now they're trying to throw me in this little tiny thing and I'm stuck in a room I've never been in. You know, and they, they just rip shit up. You know what I mean? And in the meantime, they're ripping up more muscles or tendons or whatever they ripped up, you know? Yeah. So, you know, all that kind of stuff needs to be set with an LGD, just like any other dog. Uh, you know, let me see. Uh, we'll go to the comments again. Bond is being curious about each other and it's listening to each other, it's tuning in. I like that totally. I agree with that. I, I like agree that with that a lot. lot. Uh, so the reward in the fight is of equal or lesser value than the post interaction with the handler. The reward in the fight is, yeah, yeah, and so, yeah, that the. the the reward of the fight is equal or lesser value than the post interaction with the handler. So he's asking that question. Do you think the reward of the fight is, is equal or lesser value than the post interaction with the handler? I'm not, I don't. Do you think that the dog gets more, more reward out of killing that coyote or you coming up and no. tell him good job for quitting no, the okay. coyote? I think they get more reward out of the interaction. And well, I, I don't think that I know that. Uh, okay. And here's how I know is because when my dogs kill something, be it a raccoon, they don't really kill coyotes often. Like, honestly, it really only happened when I first got them until the coyotes got the message, like, don't go over there, dude, you'll die. You know, and they'll, they'll try to come over and then they do their little fence thing with the dogs and it is what it is and then they're gone because they have self-preservation just like my dogs have self-preservation. My dogs don't want to go out there and kill them and the coyotes don't want to come in here and get hurt. You know, and so, but they'll kill raccoons because raccoons just come in and possums and stuff like that, but they don't bring them to me. They don't do anything with them. They just leave them where they're at. Like they dead, leave them there. So they don't really get any, it's not like a, a, a hunting dog or something that's like getting all this, you know, I'm sure they get off on it. Don't get me wrong. I'm sure they were like, you know, they feel tough or something. I don't know. 
but at the same time, they, uh, I don't think that they're, they're doing it because they get off on it that much. I think they're doing it because they're like, this is what's expected of me, you know, and they're territorial at the end of the day as well. They're very, very territorial. So they're doing it strictly just because you're on their territory. You're not, my dogs will, I say this all the time. It does not matter what they're guarding. They could guard a pile of rocks as long as it's within their perimeter. It doesn't matter what it is. They just don't chase livestock because that's not what they're into. You know what I mean? They don't bond with livestock because that's a load of crap. Uh, they, in these, you know, it's just, that's just, it's all just, it's crap, dude. Dogs don't bond with livestock. You know what I mean? They might be okay with them. They might get licked or something by them or, you know, whatever, eat their poop or whatever. You know, they, they, they interact with the livestock and stuff like that, but they're not like bonding with this livestock. Um, and at the same time, too, another big, big myth that they don't bond, they bond with the livestock, is that it takes two years for these dogs to be trained. Now, do you think, like, Shepherd in the middle of the mountains somewhere is going to feed a dog for two years hoping that it does its job? He can't even feed himself. Dude. Watching, watching the clock every day, be like, oh, four yeah. more months. Exactly. You'll be a if real that, dog. Other, until yeah. Then. You just have to do, just be and, something. And you want to know why they have better ratios of dogs that turn out? Because they're breeding the dogs. They're letting the dogs breed, number one. They're letting the dogs breed that naturally behaved this way. So when breeders are breeding LGDs that took two years to train, guess what? All their puppies are going to be dogs that can be trained to be LGDs. They're not going to be LGDs. You know, you could train a pit bull to be an LGD and everyone's going to go, ah, but you could, dude, you can. I, you know, I've, I've seen it mm -hmm. uh, a lot, you know, and so, but the thing is, is that like, now are you going to be able to breed that pit bull and all of its pit bull buddies or all of its pit bull babies are going to be good with chickens and stuff? No, it's going to take you some time to train that dog. But if you take a dog and you breed it to another dog that has natural behaviors, guess where they got that natural behaviors? On their genetics, man, on their inside, like all that stuff, you know. And so, when you're matching up natural behaviors, your 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 uh, chances of having more puppies that breed and have natural behaviors are going to be there. But if you breed dogs that took all this time to do a, an an act, you're not just LGDs, like anything, man. Like you train a dog to be in the circus, you're not gonna. It's not gonna make dogs that are gonna be in the circus. It's going to make dogs that might be intelligent enough to train to be in a circus. Well, it's like when we go to Michael Jordan, we don't go to Michael Jordan's babies. No, we go to college, dude, and we go look at prospects after a certain age and after they've proven yeah. themselves, right? Like Michael Jordan might have kids that might be more of a proponent to, to reach that level, right? But it's no guarantee, right. man, that, that that's just going to pop out that way. It's the rearing and, and how these dogs respond to that environment as well. Right. right, and it's also just the environment. I, I'm curious because I, I was thinking about it. I wanted to see what you thought about this. So I'm going to share my screen. This is a video that somebody sent me on Instagram. Now it's a livestock guardian dog, and I guess this pole shocked one of the goats, and then the dog has a, like a thing with the pole. So let me show this to you if I can. I want to, and I just wanted to get your feedback of what you think of, is going on in this situation, um, maybe. Hold on, how do I share my screen now? Oh, down here. <laughs> Bear with me, folks. I'm a one-man show here. All right, so. I had so had here, my wife give me out of here, so I, you don't ask me. Yeah, yeah, thank God for our wives. So here it is. So, Connor's beef with the fence explained here. Two years ago, a goat found the electric <laughs> fence while grazing to close to this post. That was the first <laughs> time it clicked for him. The fence hurt the goat. Khan's job is to protect his goats. He will react to the sounds of their distress and protect them from whatever hurt them. Look at the fear in that dog. Yeah, just by something that was different. And now he wants to pinpoint exactly where it came. He is a helicopter mom and will move them away if he thinks they're too close. Since then, he just kind of randomly yells at the post that started it all. This made me laugh. <laughs> 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 
fucking nut. You know that? You're a fucking Conch nut. Me. You know that? <laughs> what do you yeah, think? Yeah, I don't... I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't feel any way about it, to be honest with you. Uh, but that, but did you see... But, but that was cool. cool example of some body language, like you said, of that dog flipping. And do you see how quickly that, that go... Once that dog split from that... Or once that go split from that gate... That dog was on it, and boom, mohawk, and alert, yeah. and and uh, you know, um, ready to check out what was going on. You know, well, and you know, the electric fence is something that, like, I have a top wire only, um, and uh, if my fence is clicking, like if a tree fell and it's making the fence touch the electric or something like that, the dogs go pretty nuts just based on like that clicking noise and they'll sit there and bark at it and bark at it and bark at it. Cause it's something out of routine. Mm -hmm. um, I've never seen them do something like that as far as like chasing the, the animals away from the edge of the fence. Uh, I don't really know what was going on there. So I, I don't think it was bad. I don't think it was no, I don't, it malicious or anything. It was, it was, yeah. But as far as like, no, uh, as far as him, like knowing that that's what hurt the, the goat and stuff like that, I, well, I'm going to run back to the comments. I want to get through these really quick, Jason. So, and then th these people are talking about when you were talking about resource guarding for dog B. Remember what I was saying about now yeah, the yeah. dog's going to resource guard the, the kill, right? Right. Because, it, because the praise isn't there. And Frank says, this is why we need to mark proper behaviors, which is proper timing, not nurture over nature. Nature meets nurture. I like that. Nature meets nurture. What up, bud? Oh, that's Brian a guy says, and then a pattern you're set is pattern you get. Ooh. Pattern you set is pattern you get. You guys all need to learn how to spell, first of all. <laughs> I haven't seen a single one of these that didn't have a spelling error. Pattern. <laughs> pattern. <laughs> yep. Pattern. Take out the E and then you're, no, wait, take out the E and replace the R and switch the E and the R on the end. No, I'll just take it's out the E. It's not just him, it's e. been everybody. Take out this. <laughs> I guess my friends can't spell. My Kessler uh, is three years old, and she continually has impressed me. Made the point to bond with very strongly with her, and from very six seven months had her out with goats while they were kidding. Amazing. Um, and kids are the the baby goats. Just yeah. FYI. And kidding time. So kidding time is a, is a time when a lot of LGD people have a lot of problems. And that's because you've got new things coming into the pasture, which is kind of sending like mixed signals uh, to a younger dog, um, you know, and that's because they're so you like if I took like if I had a whole herd of just black sheep and I took a black sheep and I threw it in there, let's say I had six and I threw in a seventh one instantly, the dogs are going to know which one's different and they might try to kill it if I did it without them being there you know, or without me being there. If I introduce this sheep and I put it like in its own little pen uh, and let them kind of get used to it and then they see me opening and letting the new livestock animal in, I'm going to have a lot better chance than if I were to just like, here you go, you know, because they're not just the same as they don't care what they're guarding. They don't care what they're guarding from either. You know, it could be like my dogs leave little birds alone but they don't leave anything like a crow or bigger alone. Like they're going to bark at it in the air and not let it land for hawks and all sorts of stuff. Um, and it's not because like chickens, they did that before we even had chickens. We actually just recently got chickens back again. And uh, you know, it's just because it's something coming onto their territory. You know, they're a perimeter guardian. A lot of people want to, you know, shun that term when it comes to livestock guardian dogs. But at the end of the day, that's really all they're doing is guarding the perimeter. You know, yeah. and uh, and for, through poor choices of, uh, of breeding, you've got these dogs that are seeking out, uh, I think, entertainment. They're not really seeking out predators. Everybody wants to say, oh, he's running away to go uh, kill coyotes. No, he's not, because he, he should have enough self-preservation that he just wants them to stay away. Same with people. Like, they're not going to go seek people out to attack them. They're going to keep them away. And if they do keep coming, they're eventually going to have to you know, either fight or flight, I would choose the dog that fights uh, ver over the dog that flights, obviously. Um, so if you want to keep going through the comments, but I made a little note here, you, you had talked about oh, something. I, Go ahead. Uh, I with your note because I just dropped my stuff. 
Uh oh. So like you know you've got a lot of people that just expect the dog to do what they're doing, and like that they're and they're they're miseducated, I think, in the, in how they're thinking this dog is behaving versus how it's really behaving. So you've got like dogs that are running away and they're saying, oh, he's seeking out predators. No, he's not. He's just running away because he's bored or he's running away because he was bred improperly or, you know, he's running away for a, a number of reasons. Um, oh, they're barking all the time because they're keeping the coyotes away. No, they're, they could be barking all the time because they're terrified. Number one. And that's probably a big reason why they're scared. They're saying, please don't come over here. Please don't come over here. Please don't come over here. Um, or they're just barking right. because no one ever told them not to. Right. So like, and, and I think that a lot of this has to do with the bonding, like don't bond with your aunt, with your livestock guardian dog has to do a lot with laziness too, because guess what? A lot of the stuff they're doing is at night. And since you've been up all day and doing your thing and you don't want to get up in the middle of the night and go find out what they're barking at, your dog's going to bark all night long because no one's ever gone out there to say, it's cool, dude. It's coyotes two miles away. It's coyotes howling in the woods on the other side of our fence because an ambulance is driving by because there's an accident up the road, you know. And at the same time, the dog, so we're going back to A, B, right? Dog A that's had the bond and dog B that doesn't. Well, dog A, when he was a puppy, and Kendra actually did this with her dog, and it, it went really well. And do, uh, dog A is like, so you go out there <coughs> every time the dog barks when it's young, every time. And you're like, either you don't want to tell him no, just like with like a protection dog, you don't want to tell him no for like biting and things like that. And I don't really understand that world, so I won't get too much into it, but at least people can correlate it in their minds. Um, and so like, They'll, you know, they'll. Uh, you want the behavior to be encouraged, not just. Right. So you don't right. want to be like, shut up, you know, because right. then like they're not going to do it more, you know. That's how they and alert you of any threat coming by. So you, right, it's right. a tool that we need. But how do we it's, structure it to communicate? Exactly. Properly? So you've got a young dog, you know, uh, call it like Kendra's saying six, seven months. And it's now like fully out on its own, right? It's fully outside on its own. And it's barking at something at the fence. You got to get up. You got to go down there and you got to figure out what it is. And you either tell them it's okay, stop, you know, not obviously a correction, just like, all right, come on, it's cool, let's go. Um, or you're working with them. Like you've got your gun or you've got your flashlight or you've got whatever you've got. And now the dog knows that fear isn't going to be there because the dog knows I'm not in this alone, you know, strength, strength in numbers. Exactly. Every time I bark and do this bark, my owner comes out and helps me with what's going on. And a coyote will sit there on the other side of my fence with like five grown dogs going wild in its face. If I go down there and I turn on a flashlight, they're gone, dude, they're gone, like automatically gone. And so now the dogs get to go back to just being dogs and making sure that nothing else comes. And they're not up all night stressing out about this coyote that probably isn't going to leave. He's going to stay there because a lot of people, another thing they do is dog barks. And I'm talking about like neighborhood dogs, dogs barking, get in the house. So they call the dog in the house. Now the coyote can go through their yard. Well, they don't have livestock, so it doesn't matter. The coyote can go through their yard. But like, I can't call my dogs in, right? So the coyote is literally just sitting there waiting for me to get annoyed enough because that's what he's used to with other places to call the dog inside. Well, I'm not calling my dogs inside. You know what I mean? And so now I'm going to have to go out there and get this coyote to go away. And it's the dog that has the help that's going to want to do it even more and is going to end up being a quieter and better dog in the end. You're not going to have complaints for, you know, noise complaints and things like that. Uh, because your dog is only going to bark for a certain amount of time because you're going to get your happy ass out there and help your dog out because you've got this bond with it. And you know, if it's barking, it's barking at something. It's not barking at like migrating fucking butterflies or whatever else these people think that their dogs are barking at all night. And uh, how do you, how do you deter barking? Like, like barking that, that is like nuisance. Okay. You so ever, I, you ever <laughs> correct it, Madison? I do later on. Right. Okay. So once like, a bond is like thoroughly like, dude, what the fuck? Once you they know? exactly. Yeah. Once you can like yell at your dog, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know what <laughs> mean. Um, then, but also at the same time too, is like, you know, uh, I do this with a headlamp. Right. And so like I have a headlamp on 
and I'm going down there and this is like a, this is a tried and true method that I've told many, many people. It works very, very well. Okay. And when I'm going down or I'm like, sometimes I sleep outside with these dogs, like in the, their first spring, you know, cause like they're just getting out to start working alone around the same time as coyotes are starting to breed. So it's like a crazy time, but it's also getting warm and I hate being inside. So like I get to sleep outside, I get to bond more with my dogs and I get to train them. Right. And so like, I've got my headlamp on and the dogs are barking and I'm walking over. Now they're like associating this headlamp with me coming to help them. Right. So like when they're younger, you actually have to be there, you know, like they, they, they're not smart enough, mature enough to, to realize that like this light from the porch means like, Hey dude, I got your back from all the way up here. You know what I mean? So you're going down there, good dog, you know, good dog at barking at what you're barking at. And you stay there until the threat is gone. And then the dog stops barking. You tell them, good. All right, come on, let's go. Well, then if they're barking at something that they shouldn't be, you, okay, come on, let's go and just bring them back with you. And it takes time, dude. It's annoying. It's annoying. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. especially, you, you know, it's cold, it's wet, whatever it is. And, and you've been up all day and all this and that. Uh, but in the long run, this dog's going to work for like 12 years. You know what I mean? So like, uh, it's a very split, it's like a small blip in time compared to how long this dog's going to be working. So sometimes like the coyotes will be barking from far away and my dogs are getting carried away. And you, I've got a bathroom like right upstairs that faces out to like where they usually are barking towards the coyotes. Well, now all I have to do is turn my headlamp on and generally they'll turn around and I'll just be like, shut up. You know, and they'll know from that headlamp, they're like, they remember, he will come out here. You get what I mean? So, like, not only am I able to correct my dogs now because they know that our bond has had corrections and things before and we're still, you know, tight. Uh, but they also know because they're smart that before I was coming outside to tell them, OK, it's cool. And then, OK, it's cool turned into shut up, you know. Uh, and, and the, the headlamp really like lets them know. And sometimes they just kind of see red and they just can't stop barking. And so now you shine the flashlight and they're like, what the hell is that? And they forget completely about what was going on. And you're like, it's fine, dude, shut up. Yeah. You know? So the it's kind of, they for, forgot what's going on tells you that it's not that significant in the first place. Exactly. They just get, especially females, like they just get carried away with the barking and sometimes all it takes is just like a click of that headlamp and they're like, oh, that's him. Shit. You know, and uh, the headlamp trick works really, really, really well for LGDs. And I guess it would work well for any kind of dog. It's, and it, it also lets them know at the same time as a correction might need to take place. It lets them know that like, hey, I've got your six from up here in the window. You know what I mean? Like I'm looking at what you're looking at because my flashlight's going out in that direction that you're looking at. And you can tell that it's bright there because you can see just as well as I can. And you know that I'm looking at what you're looking at and I'm telling you like, Hey, if it comes near here, I'm going to shoot it. You know, yeah. if it comes near here, I'm going to, you know, and they, and the coyotes see that headlamp and they're gone. So like now my dogs are like bark, 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 you know, who knows? Maybe they're saying shine that flashlight, dude, they're coming. <laughs> you turn the flashlight on and they turn around they're like, cool, dude. All right. Well, we'll go back to scratch my ass, you know? And so that's the, that's the headlamp trick. Very cool, man. Um, going back to the comments here, it says um, Rika greets me at the gate every time we come home. There's another misspelling. <laughs> I'm telling you, dude. <laughs> we sit and have a greeting session, rain or shine. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Jason Kessler, oh, we got a long one here. I know, here I might have to read this one. Uh, I know you don't like to anthropomorphize, anthropomorphize dogs. And even though I'm a fur mom, <laughs> did, did you catch them? Your, that's what I asked my fur mom. I'm like, did you like, catch them yourself? Did you chew the, <laughs> the umbilical cord? And, put the, and they're like, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah, totally. Um, <laughs> let me see. I'm going to have to read this on my page, I think, because I don't know if I... Um, hold on. Stay, stay. Here, you read, you read the first part. If, can you see it? Well, I'm, yeah. Uh, it says Jason Kessler. I know you don't like to anthropomorphize dogs. I don't know how to say that word. And even though I'm a fur mom, I typically don't as well. But one way I explain to people when it comes to subjects of LGDs uh, and independent thinking, it's like thinking about the kid that never leaves town versus the kid uh -huh. that joins the military and travels the world. Who's going to have more slash better information for making smarter decisions as an adult? 
the kid that only knows home, uh, how hometown or the kid that's seen more of the world. The same applies to dogs. The dog with more inputs is going to be more capable dog when it comes to making decisions, outputs, than the dog with few inputs. You get out what you put in. Just one way I look at it. Thanks, Jared. Yeah, I mean, the dog, the, I think that that kind of stuff builds confidence in the dog, too, because they're just kind of like been there, done that. Uh, you know, I've seen bigger things than, than just that. Um, and, and they're, you know, all these all these situations that a dog has maybe a little bit of fear going into and then comes out on the other end, uh, a better dog for getting through it uh, builds up their confidence. And the, the more confident dog, the more it's going to want to be the dog at the fence you know what i mean the more it's going to want to be the dog doing what it wants to do uh or the, the dog is going to do what you want it to do more because it's more confident going into that situation there's no hesitations there because it's seen these type of things you know um well, and also and it, that kind of go ahead it's a form of toughening that i was think is so valuable and that's the one variable that's missing out of pet world is like these dogs and and when i say tough like i have to ask people like pretend like i'm a director of a movie and i'm casting you or i need no you're a director of a movie and i'm and you need to cast a scene that that requires somebody to be tough you know let me let me hear what it says and a lot of times they're like it's so brutal dude they're like some guy <laughs> like slash murderer or what and i'm just like that's I'm more like thinking about handing you a, a difficult Rubik's cube tough. Like <laughs> I want to challenge you. Like I want you to be like better. Like don't just give up on something when it, when it, when it, when you, when it doesn't feel good, like you could like strive and, and get through it. And that's right. where we need to be with our dogs too, is like, look, some of the stuff and that we're going to ask of these dogs, especially at the, the forefront is, is either going to evoke a, a sense of confusion or, you know, um, fear, right. That, uh, they, they don't know. And then once we get to the other side, not only does it build a confidence and uh, that toughness within that dog, but now it's also build that, that bond stronger with you and that dog, because you've been through this experience together. Right. Well, and that's the other thing too. A lot of people are asking their dogs to do shit. They'd never do. Mm -hmm. Right. Stay outside all night and watch my fence. I'm not fucking going out there. You start sleeping on the ground with your dogs in a little tiny fire and hanging out. Dude, and I should see like, hey, this dude will sleep on the ground with me. You know what I mean? Same with like protection dogs. Like go through that tunnel. You know, I'm not going through that tunnel. You go through that tunnel. You know, the dog's going to, they're smart. They're like, why the fuck isn't he going through the tunnel? I go through the tunnel every fucking time. You know, it's like a lot of training people that do, you know, uh, that, that do things where you have to do it with your dog. Their dog does so much better. Your dog does so much better because you're doing it with them. You know what I mean? And and uh, I think that that's also for the goose. That's also gander. Yeah. Hey man, I gotta I gotta take a leak really quick. Is that cool? Yeah. Do your thing. I'll hold that conversation. Just try to decipher the comments. I'll decipher. Okay. I'll go solo while you're peeing. So. He's peeing. I muted his mic just in case, but uh, looks like, oh, while I'm here, you guys, uh, check out if you like what I'm doing here. My name is Bow Wow Bill. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. I'm over on Twitter as well, and I'm trying to, to, to get as many people to um, join my Patreon. So Bow Wow Bill Patreon so I can actually travel and uh, do some live interviews with uh, professionals and like go and maybe spend the night on the the ground with Jason there. Oh look, here he is. The, dude, that was a pretty quick pee, man. I, I told you that. <laughs> Whoops. No, I need to add to the stream. There we go. There we go. Okay. It's like right there. So it's perfect. Dang. All right. So <laughs> so um yeah, um I, I'm gonna put a link to my Patreon. That's what I was telling people. I was trying to plug my Patreon while you're peeing. And uh What's Patreon. It's like a thing that they can pay monthly. It's like a ten dollar, twenty dollar thing if they like what I'm doing here. And pay this man. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Well, I'm saying because then I can travel and I want to be able to travel around. Like I would love to come out and 
hang out and meet your dogs or you know just certain, certain <laughs> you can't things. meet my yeah. dogs i know but <laughs> <laughs> everybody's always like oh I'd, I'd love to come out and you know hang out with your dogs i'm like yeah, it's we different can hang out we yeah, can hang out so they're definitely not like uh you know where i'm like oh this person's fine and which is another thing too is like everybody wants to live in like disney world man like one of my mentors you know made that point and it kind of sticks in my head quite a bit about the disneyland thing is like oh well my dog knows if it's a bad guy bullshit shut up your dog you know sure your if your dog can bite on command then fine okay it can be around other people if your dog is not biting on command if your dog's doing guard work uh and you think it could be around people or it can be, if you think it could be around people you're putting people in danger if your dog is really a guard dog and that's if, a huge liability man it's a huge liability and if your dog can be around people then there's one of two things going on one is your dog's shit and it's not going to be a guard dog or your dog is not uh, your dog is not going to act instantly. It's going to hesitate. And what happens in any type of situation, even with a human being, if you hesitation hesitate, kills. yeah, hesitation will kill you. Twenty-two feet. You know what I mean? Like within twenty-two feet, another human being could kill you. Boom, done. Mm -hmm. If your dog is letting somebody in within twenty-two feet of them, they can also be killed. And so if they're not going automatically, like you are not Jason, you're not his wife and you're not his son, then I'm going to go after you instantly. Or you've got the dog that goes, well, you're not Jason, his wife, his son, or there's a hundred people that he said, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. You want a dog asking no fucking questions. Yep. And mm -hmm. it makes perfect sense to me. And just like I was saying to you earlier, like when my, when I was working with these dogs earlier, like I wasn't allowed, they they came up and said no dogs out of that that car, and I'm just like, I mean, it's just a no nonsense thing, man. Like it's it's literally life and death. Yeah, and, and hesitation kills. And if these yep. dogs were to uh, were to hesitate, it, the 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 predators would find that hole. I guarantee it, man. They would find the hole in their program and exploit it. Um, yep. And that's just what they do, dude. And I guess that the, the video I said earlier or I watched earlier with the the goat um, livestock guardian dog's name is Khan. Yeah. And Khan the dog. He's a good dog. Can't blame him. 35 still don't understand electricity and uh, routine acknowledgement. Their alert seems to be keen. Okay. And then so, Teresa's still here too. She's a Patreon supporter. Thank you, Teresa. I love you. Nice. And so here's another thing too is like uh, – you know, a hesitation with a predator, they have a little more leeway, I think, just because the predator has self-preservation. But it got me thinking about one of the biggest threats, I think, besides, uh, you know, natural predators to a dog that's an LGD is stray dogs, right? Because a lot of stray dogs have been bred by humans to not have self-preservation. And so what that does is it creates a dog that doesn't care if it gets hurt. It, does, it doesn't know that that could happen to it. You know, pit bulls, uh, Malinois, all these dogs, all that self-preservation, like they'll jump through fire like an idiot to go get somebody. You know what I mean? But uh, so when you've got stray dogs and another dog that's hesitating because it's been socialized with random dogs coming over and it hesitates for a second, that hesitation is going to get it killed. You know what I mean? That hesitation is going to, is gonna, or at least it's going to give, that smaller dog that they would automatically crush if they got the first hand on it uh, is, is going to, you know, injure them, you know? And if let's say you only have one or two livestock guardian dogs and you know, this dog comes in, that's a, a stray dog, they hesitate, they get hurt. Now you're putting that dog up because it's hurt. And the coyotes have all been watching, you know, like I was telling you the other night, I brought all of my dogs schedules just got crazy brought all of my dogs in at once. What happened within like 30 minutes, man, coyotes were like right there, right there in an area where they never, ever, ever go. It was like, it wasn't past a fence, but it was right up next to a fence in an area that's like well onto my property. And uh, that was just from them being like, ha he brought them all in at once, you know? Yeah. They're watching, dude. You're always watching. You know, and I was going to, uh, coyote nation. I think I'm going to put a link up to this. Um, this book is that it no that's not it <laughs> that's not the one i was thinking about coyote america coyote america 
um, is a book where they talk and they give these wild stories about how cunning. I mean, just think about it, dude. How long has coyotes been around? And <laughs> they don't need any of our helps. Five million right. year biography of this extraordinary animal. Right, so five million year biography, and it's probably um, way longer than that because we have no concept of real time. Anyways, yeah. so I'll put a link up to this Coyote America, and then Joe Rogan did an interview with this author, and I highly recommend it, especially for you, Jason. Um, yeah, Coyote America. People are commenting in the and making mention in the comments, and we have a all. It's the Shaved Club, the the club of non shaved people. <laughs> Somebody commented. <laughs> I am a non-shaved person, so that is yeah. true. Good job. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, overrated. And the coyotes, man, like, um, I mean, they are opportunistic, and man, they seize. And guess what? They're not. They're not purpose. I mean, they're purposefully bred by the law of nature, right? Oh, and, oh, and and and. and Oh, wait, what's going on? Here My phone went to, I was just, people keep sending me messages and I was making sure it wasn't involved with this thing and then it went to your Oh, it's all good. And it echoed. It, it, well, and I want you to mention too, so you have a tattoo on the side of your head of the wolf, right? And was that the no, wolf? That was, both sides are like, I don't know how to do this. Is that the wolf that they were drinking from the teats of? Oh, no. Um, that These are like from a temple that they had... Uh, they found actually. Let me tell you so that way you can look it up. I don't know how to print how to spell the. Uh, it's a they're Sumerian, but I don't know how to spell the. Uh, have a comment here. Every, everyone dealing with coyote should one hundred percent read Coyote America. Absolutely, and it's on Audible too. And then Joe, like I said, Joe Rogan did an interview with the the author and. I mean, just for instance, man, these coyotes with the big livestock guardian dogs, the dogs that aren't with it, the coyotes will go in and uh, and and befriend this dog and like start playing with this dog and then and then lure this dog away from the from the, their property and then all the dogs will attack it and kill it and and you know it's it's wild, man. These dogs are brutal. For the brutal. Uh, the name of that temple is N I N E V E H. And if you did like Sumerian dog statues from that North Palace. Um, and like, this is how magical, you know, people believe dogs are, is that like, not only did they use them uh, against humans and predators and things like that, but like they buried statues of dogs next to their doors to keep spirits away. And nowadays people might think that's all hokey bullshit, but you know, uh, I can think of a lot of things they believe in this total okay, bullshit <laughs> you know and so here's the, the image uh, when i come up so with. This, the second that one right there is the one that's on this side and then the, there's another one that little red one is the one that's on the other side um and uh you know they were they were found at a, at a temple and i just like the, the thing about like how how uh you know magical people used to think dogs are and some people still do um it's just insane man and i mean insane in a good way like not you know insane bad like I, they're just do they like, make i do make i make little glass figurine of dogs that's what i do and really? I, yeah so it's wild man that stuff i'm gonna make these dude look at this bro yeah Molosser dog, cuneiform text. And cuneiform, we got to remember, is the first way of like real communication before. I mean, and, and not only that, but the cuneiform tablets was the first form of money. I mean, and uh, like, and how we, we became like to the money that we use today, the, the means of the bearer of, um, and becomes a means of exchange. Look at this, man. There's well, so like cool. the. I don't even know what this is, but. You know, and, and people, you know, believed in this stuff and still do so much that, like, all that cuneiform that's on the side of that dog all goes into something that, like, each one of those chisel points had real meaning. You know what I mean? And, and that goes back in, you know, if they meant that much in something where they made this dog, 
imagine the meaning they had in their training with their dogs, man. Imagine the connections they had and the bonds they had with their dogs. They were real. They were 100% real. And that's what you were talking about. Oh, no, no, that's not it. There's no. another one. I can't the remember. Three. The three. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's. And that she had like two children and whatnot. Um, yeah, yeah. Opsis or something like that. I can't remember, but. But you know, and and like the dogs w w worked with these people better because they were real with their dogs and they were doing these things with their dogs rather than wanting their dogs to do them for them. You know, and uh, it's just like the, it, that's what's lost. The magic is what's lost. You know, and if. Uh, it's become yeah. transactional. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Treat training. You know what I mean? And like, sure, you could do that. It works for you. Fine. Um, but it's just not, it's not how it's always been, man. You know, the, the, you know, people that work with their dogs and do things at the same time as their dog does them are going to get way better performance out of their dog and it doesn't have to be a working performance that's like another thing too is like people want to take working dogs and breed them and then say that everyone that doesn't cut it is now going to be a pet home well i i think that pet trainers will will totally 100 percent agree with me that a pet dog's under way more stress than a guard dog yeah a pet dog's under way more stress than a sport dog so why, because this dog in evaluations handled stress so shitty or was fearful or was something that didn't cut it as like this professional aspect and most uh, protection dogs and all this stuff are, are professional exercisers. Uh oh, oh, okay. I went back. Um, and so like the thing is, is that like now you've got a dog that you say doesn't cut it to do your exercising um, or working and you send it into a pet home where there's like kids throwing stuff and nerf darts and you know all sorts of things going on and you've got this dog that like showed you early signs of maybe becoming a reactive dog later on in life and you send them to the most stressful situation there is being a pet because being a pet has a ton more expectations i think people might not realize it but it has a lot of expectations on that dog you know, uh, to live in a house is fucking stressful. Well, dude, I mean, I can't take it for that long. <laughs> there we go. And Romulus. Yep. This is it. Romulus. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Ramus, yep. The statues name it. And then, um, Kendra is also saying that the statues had names on them, individual features, protective idols. So, so cool, man. And you better yeah, well, believe it, dude. I've had a conversation and, and, I won't cry, but dude, I used to just cry when I started talking about this because anytime I, my, any of my dogs that have gone to heaven before they go, I have that conversation with them. Like, I'm honored to have this experience with you. And as I depart this vessel of my body, I hope to be intertwined with you energetically forever. If that is something that you would consider, I would appreciate it. I asked the, the animal to do it because I do think it's an energetic and infinite uh, bond right and that's why that bond here being established is so very important well when they come back you know i think dogs you know there's only a certain amount of spirits you know human animal and stuff like that i think that you know it's the same you know just like spirits are recycled into different vessels and humans i think it's the same with dogs and uh you know they're what did you know, what were you saying about the dog scene in different worlds when we were speaking earlier so like, you know, we're very, very, uh, like as human beings, we're, we're like, you know, this will sound hokey bullshit, but you know, we're very hypnotized into this like way of living and being, I mean, like, look at me, I'm fucking living in a house. Like why? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, it doesn't make any sense. And like, you have a watch on, but like, who the fuck told you it's, you know, it's uh 724 here. Like, what does that even fucking mean? You know what I mean? Like, it's just dark. That's it. You know? And it just tells you that you have to be here at this time. You know? And, like, dogs don't have that. Dogs don't have that constraint on them. Like, sure, they're forced into, like, living in the house sometimes, or they're forced into living outside and things by, like, they're humans, but they're walking in, like, two different worlds. Um, and there's, like, a few dog trainers out there that talk about this kind of stuff, and I think their, their dogs are better for it. 
Um, but like dogs are walking on like two different, they're walking on like a spiritual plane and like here, whatever we call this bullshit at the same time, you know what I mean? And so like they can guard you in, in a different world and see things that we can't. I mean, why do you think that like some dogs don't trust certain people, even though they've been like introducing them a million times and they're just like, "Mm -mm, nope, 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 nope. And like some of them might just be weird people, but some of them might be a fucking alien. I don't know. You know what I mean? Like, so you know, and like the thing is, is like sometimes like your dog will just like, you know, up into the corner of a room or something like that. And you know, there's people throughout history. I'm not going to bring up any names here, but like they would keep dogs with them to keep those things away. You know, uh, and there, there's a, there's a reason, and, and, and there, there there's dogs that that can sense that and i think it's all dogs are kind of that way um i think that you can you know work with your dog in order to bring those kind of things out um but at the same time i think they're all able to do it because they're not all like programmed as much as we are to live in this bullshit society that we're that we're living in you know what i mean and like they don't have all the constraints that we do um i think they they care what you think about them um, some of them do, especially like the bonded ones, but do you think they care what your neighbors think about them? No. You know, do you think they care about what the fucking dog groomer thinks about them? No. You know, do they, 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 they care that Trump, Trump is president. Yeah. They, they're like, they're on the same page as me. They're like, I just don't, I don't give a fuck. I'd rather have no president. You know what I mean? Totally. Like, <laughs> so it's like, that's the thing. Like they don't have all those constraints. You know what I mean? Like they don't have time. You know, it's either dark out and I need to, you know, use my nighttime skills or it's light out and I need to use my light time skills. And these things happen during the day and these things happen at night and they they see things so much more simpler. Therefore, they're able to act uh, so much better in situations than humans are, you know, and. I think we can learn a lot from that, Dave, because of, like we we have to realize that our time in our time zones. Look it up, man. Like that's train schedules. That's so we can get commerce. Yeah. It's like it was all capitalism. Like these are all motives that made things easier for products to fly or people workers to to be on time or whatever. Like there's there's a lot of ulterior motives that kind of take away from the natural law um, aspect of our existence. And we call it you call it monkey like monkey world or man's law right where where we have social right. rules that these dogs i mean it's just like jaywalking dude like a dog's like oh there's a is there a crosswalk around here yeah exactly they just cross the fucking road and you know right. when, the, when, when a street dog won't cross the road is when it knows it might get hit by a car you know what i mean but like yeah. the dog that's never even been around cars isn't even fucking thinking about that you know what i mean well, it's thinking about something totally different than done you know, and, and then they're done. And guess what? That 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 trial is over. And and the, when I was talking to Kashi, like um, we were talking about the, the Indian dogs, and that's where I, I can't wait to go to India to go. And I just want to watch them, dude. Just watch watch them navigate the streets. And that's what they were saying is the coolest thing to watch these dogs navigate the roads, and not not because they figured it out, man. And right. And well, know. and. and- and two is so like you've got these dogs that are so in tune with feelings and things like that, um, that when you are that way with like when you so you're just normal and you're you spike some fear and that puts off like a smell that dogs can smell. I, I don't know if it's a smell because I've never asked a dog, but they do know it, you know, mm-hmm. and so like it, it could be anything that they're sensing. It could be just a change in vibrations, you know. And uh, they know that you're scared or they know that you're sad and they're going to make you unsad, you know, and that, because they know these feelings. And so like that goes into dog training too. Is so like when you're going into a situation with a dog and you're thinking in your head, my dog's going to fail this. He's not going to do it. You know what I mean? He's going to not do it, you know, because you have already sent out these vibrations to this dog who lives on this other plane uh, mm-hmm. at the same time living on ours that you don't think he's going to do it. You know what I mean? And so like, that's automatically going to send off the, the wrong thing. Same with like protection training. And I was just talking about this with a buddy of mine. Um, is that like, if the dog doesn't see it as real and just sees it as a game, 
you know, and that's referred to in a lot of training is like, oh, it's just the protection game. He, he's learning the game. Yes. OK, cool. That's that's cool and all uh, to show them what you want. But at the same time, like if they don't think it's totally real, like LGDs who are very much in tune with that kind of stuff, they're not going to do it. They're just they not going to do difference. it. Yeah, they know the difference, and to and to to think that they don't is a disservice to that animal, dude. And to show like the the, the scope of of um, you know just lack of knowledge that we have. I think, and I've sold it. I've said this many times on so many conversations that I've had. I I think we sell these dogs short, dude. You are, yeah. It's 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 crazy how like like just let the dog or and I'm guilty of it too. And one of my mentors is like, Bill, let the dog do. Yeah, <laughs> let the dog do what the dog's gonna freaking do. Don't get in there and try to interfere. Don't lure the shit. Don't think he calls it. Don't be a dancing monkey. <laughs> And no yeah. ching, ching, chinky chonga, like no talking. He's like, let the dog do, man. Just freaking be and observe and be that presence that's that's not going to influence this dog, but be there when the dog does to to reward it, you know? And, right. Um, we were and talking, it, too. Use, use that okay. time as like an evaluation time of not only your dog, but yourself, too. You know, a lot of people need to fucking work on themselves before they work with the dog. Fucking a dude, and the dogs become an emotional dumping ground in, in sense, you know. And I, yeah. I, I've, I've worked on myself, man, and I'm working on myself, and I understand this stuff on a deeper level, and um, you know, and and, and it, it, it only will benefit you to work on yourself. And just like we were talking about earlier about bonding with the dog, bonding with the kid as a puppy and as a child, the kid might not might adjust it, it, because we're, they're in a human world but it still teaches them coping strategies that might not be healthy. And, um, and these, the kids need to have, you know, the, the strength to live this world and have the tools of this life, um, to wherever they're going to find themselves. And, and the crazy thing is, man, is that you breed these dogs. And I remember we were talking about like sending one dog, one, one direction and another dog, another direction. I want to mention that, but that, All let that go to show you. Yeah, the adaptability, man. Let that go to show you that that we have proof of this stuff, man. We have proof of 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 like there is a second type of influence that is there to to aid this dog in survival, and yep. um, we call it epigenetics or above genetics. But if we send a dog to a different environment, the dog will change, and and how so? with the adaptability okay so just take like two litter mates for instance and like with with land raised dogs aboriginal dogs whatever you want to call them uh you're going to get a lot of variation in the litter anyways because it's not like a cookie cutter golden retriever type breed but uh let's say so like kendra who's been in here so like i, I had two dogs born literally twins same sack boom same two twins both black and tan both same parents both exactly the same dog I kept one here in Northern Illinois. I sent one down to her. The one down in Texas, very slim, longer built, shorter coat, uh, you know, more springy, like long distance moving. The one I kept up here, more stout, longer hair, you know, just a, a bigger dog to be able to handle the, the, the winter. And you can see it in a lot of my dogs. Like if I take a dog and I send, you know, from a litter and I send some some to the Northeast, some to, you know, Idaho, some to here, some to there, and then one to Florida. The one in Florida looks like a German Shepherd almost. Wild. You know? And so, and then also this goes back to not just my dogs, but how I was saying that, like, all of these LGDs are the same fucking dog. They're all the same dog. They all came from the same place. You know what I mean? And the only thing that made them different, besides a little bit of choosing how they're bred, is literally just their environment. You know, just their environment. So, like, You've got Middle Eastern dogs who don't spend too much time in the mountains. They're a lot like they got a lot more leg to them. They're not as low to the ground um, and they're covering large distances. Right. And then you've got like these dogs that are up in the Himalayas and there's plateau type Tibetan Mastiffs and there's high elevation type Tibetan Mastiffs. And they're a little bit different. One's a little more springy. The other one's a little more, you know, stout. Um, and then you've got like, you know, your dogs that are here and your dogs that are there, and your dogs that are here and there. And what worked for one area might not have worked for another. Now, like in an area where it's real wet all the time, a dog with like long hair is going to die. 
you know, it's going to get all sorts of like rot under that hair and it's going to, it's going to freeze to death and stuff like that. The dog that can shake off and get all that woolly coat just automatically dry is going to last a lot longer. So who's going to be in like the Carpathians or somewhere where it's more of a, a wet environment than somewhere that's dry, like the Himalayas, you know, uh, the dog with the woolly coat is going to last there. The dog with the longer coat isn't going to last and isn't going to breed. Um, so, and then, then top that off with being so aboriginal and wild and this and that is that like very quickly, you're going to be able to make these changes as not you as a breeder, but the dog is going to just make those changes on its own. It actually be harder for you with these dogs to have it not change. Right. Yeah. No kidding. Well, you'd have to set a, a you know, a, an environment, a surrogate environment. Yeah. You just lock them in a fucking kennel all day and make them whatever they, you know, whatever you want. Or a house, you know. Yeah, <laughs> houses. You know, the only thing that that relates to a dog's, uh, you know, undercoat and stuff like that is uh, the hours of daylight. That's it. You know, so once there's less daylight, the dog's undercoat starts growing. Once there's more daylight, they shed it off. So if they're in an area where the hours of daylight are a lot longer, they're going to have less of an undercoat. You know, if they're in an area like where it's dark all the time, their coat's going to get freaking thick, dude. You Which know? makes sense. I mean, it, it. I mean, it's. But it's also the adaptability of being here on Earth. You know, and and right. Uh, right. Who knows if there's other dogs on other planets, man? I'm sure there know. are. I'm sure there are too, dude. And look at like all I need to know is like I'll just just look at at sea life, bro. We don't even know what what's underneath that water and just look at all the vast variety of, of sea creatures and there has to be life i mean i'm sure of it well whoever or whatever put us here put us here with dogs period I don't you care put what them says. under you can put them under lights and they'll stay slick coated no shit yeah and shorter days funny. equals thick hair just like horses you can put them under lights and they'll stay slick coated so wild, man. I mean, who figured that shit out? I'd be like, dude, well, my... <laughs> if you stick well, a light underneath them, you know? That's what they do with chickens to keep them laying eggs all year. They put, and that's what they do with, like, cows over here to keep them, you know, uh, producing at a good rate. They give them UV light. Yeah, surrogate. Um, they surrogate whatever it is that they need. And, it, and what it is is it's basically the melatonin, um, like, cycle, I guess. I don't know that the... the what do you call that? The sleep cycle. It's the what is the sleep cycle called when it kicks in? Like the rapid eye movement stuff? No, I can't remember what it's called. Sleep cycle. I'll figure it out here. We have Google. Everything is Google. Circadian rhythm. That's it. That right when I start to type it in, circadian rhythm. You know, and and um, that's what like these. So circadian rhythm and the morphogenetic field of influence. That's what that's what Rupert Sheldrake has co has coined this this like this this ether, I guess, or or whatever's out there that permeates all life that we're all connected to. And human beings, our our conscious mind, try tries to convince us that we're not connected to that. We, we're we're individuals experiencing life. And there's this thing called solipsism where where your perception becomes the only truth and a lot of people believe that their perception yeah okay is the I know only exactly. truth, right yeah, yeah, so yeah. individuate somebody all the way to the level where they think that that this world or this this experience is it's to to serve them this experience on this earth instead of what i think that <clears throat> would happen when you start to allow yourself to be given to the experience is is you 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 kind of feel that oneness and you become more more connected to the energetic realm that the same realm that these these dogs are connected to as well. Does right, that make any sense? Of, at all? Yeah, because okay. at the same time too, if you kind of take that mm -hmm. twist it a little tiny bit, when you're working on becoming more conscious, you know, like a lot of people are now, um, at the same time. Uh, you're working on yourself, therefore you're able to work with your dog better because you know yourself and you're able to communicate with your dog better because your dog is already on that level. 
You know what I mean? Your dog is already, you know, very conscious of what's going on. Very, you know, there's nothing really there that this dog is, uh, you know, questioning or whatever, uh, because it already, which way do I go to stay in this thing this way? Uh, <laughs> it's opposite. <laughs> it freaks and me out. so, yeah. And, and, and I think that that has a lot to do with like, where, you know, whether or not people want to believe that kind of stuff, um, it just right comes right back to working on yourself uh, becoming more conscious of like of yourself um, and what, you know, and th then therefore you're going to have a better relationships with every thing, including something that's already, you know, in that same plane. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if that well, made any sense or if that just could no, it, it made sense, but and know that, that we have so many things that keep us from turning that lens inward. Right. And the biggest thing is money. Right. Where people think that they need material possessions to fulfill that void that will only be filled by going within. And uh, one of my favorite quotes is, is the Oracle of Delphi. And she talks about um, know thyself. And she says, um, uh, heed these words. Here, let me find the exact quote here. Actually, I'll put it. I'll share the, the screen here if I can. Oh, wait. Uh, heed these words. Here, I'll share the screen. Maybe. There we go. Heed these words. You who wish to probe the depths of nature, right, or work with animals, if you do not find within yourself that which you seek, neither will you find it outside. If you ignore the wonders of your own house, how do you expect to find other wonders? In you is hidden the treasure of treasures. Know thyself, and you will know the universe and the gods. Yeah. One of my favorite quotes. And that, well, and that kind of coincides with, uh, remember how I was telling you about how, uh, you know, so people did better with dogs before they had all these other people telling them, you know, how to do it and why they should do it and everything like that. At the same time, that kind of sparked from that quote is I had also told you previously when we spoke was that if people worried more about what was going on with their own dog or their own situation, we'd be like a lot better off for it. And so would the dogs. Right. And so, like, if you weren't so worried about your dog being Bill's dog and you were just worried about your dog being your dog and what it took to get your dog to where you want to be. Your dog and you are going to have a way better relationship. You're, and, and then you, your dog, is going to be better to you, which at the end of the day is all that fucking matters. Who cares what other people think about your dogs, dude? If I sat around and worried about what other people think about my dogs, I wouldn't have any fucking dogs. You know? I just wouldn't. I wouldn't have because, like, there's so many people that have told me, oh, they need this, they need that, they need to do this. Oh, you're doing this wrong. Oh, working them is abuse and all this other stuff man if i listened to them and i didn't just listen to my dog i wouldn't have dogs you know what i mean and you, you'd be in an institution <laughs> yeah <laughs> but like the thing is dude is like nobody at the end of the day really gives a shit about your dog you know what i mean like like i might like your dog i might think it's cool or something like that but like when i go to bed I'm not like thinking about your fucking dog. You know what I mean? And then if you think that I am, you're doing you and your dog a disservice because you should be thinking about what you think about your dog. Not what some jackass in Georgia thinks. You know what I mean? Like who cares, dude? You know what I mean? Like that guy's probably doing something else right now. And you're sitting there worried about, Oh, well, my dog didn't blah, blah, blah didn't full mouth grip. Like, who fucking cares? Did it do what you wanted it to do? And you were trying to show people, hey, look, my dog did what I wanted it to do. And then you have a whole thread of people telling you about how it should have done it better. Like five minutes ago, you thought it was the coolest fucking thing in the world. Now, all of a sudden, you're like ready to shoot the dog. You know what I mean? And it's like, worry about what you care about about your dog. You don't need to worry about what other people care about your dog. You know, I mean, obviously, the you know, if some people are like, dude, your dog should not do it. You know, and they're a professional telling you like, hey, look, like this, this is going to turn real bad one day, you know, like, yeah, listen to them. 
But right. like, if it's just like some jackass Karen on the internet telling you like, oh, you do, it's gonna die because you're letting it do bite work, like fuck her, dude. Who cares? Yeah. You know. There's plenty of those out there too, and not only that, but oh, I know. When you trade money for advice, it's a totally different ballgame, man, because I could walk up to somebody right down the street and tell them, hey, man, do this, do that, grab this right here, do this, and your walk is going to be day and night, you know, or something like that. Like, But they never asked me, and, and if I even tried to do that, you know, an unsought diagnostics is met with animosity big time, bro. Like they're going to be like, who the fuck are you? And who asked you? And dude, yeah. because, because of that special bond and the, the relationship it's like, dude, this is my dog. Right. right. That, that's what I like, dude. And that's where like, as a professional, this is where, where I've kind of like had to have like kind of a sober awakening of, of sometimes when, when people hire professionals, they, are, it's kind of looked at as a weakness because they're they're unable to bond with that dog, and I think that I think that that is like looked on like people are like, why would you why would you hire a professional? Just bond like do it yourself or whatever. I think that that in a way needs to come back, but some people are they they just are incapable of it. Like that lady I I talked about that stopped me in my tracks with that question. Like, what do you mean? Well, like, how do I bond with the dog? And I'm just like, oh shit. Good question. See, I'm I'm bad at that because like when when you said that and you said that you stumbled on that question, the first thing I thought of like what my answer would be is like, if you don't know that, maybe you shouldn't have dogs. I can't say that. I I, I, mean, I know you can't. I, I, know, I can. I, know, but I can. But right. she would be like, all right, later, and I'd be like, well, I I, I want to genuinely. No, I, I maybe get it. It's toxic positivity. Maybe it's something that I need to like have a be like, dude, like this because it is like I'm perplexed about it. I've 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 I still don't really have an answer because it is I don't at all. I'm still thinking about it. Even the back of my head while we're well, this whole time I've been thinking about that question and I'm like, I don't fucking know. I mean I, I can tell you things to, tell to do you. with your dog that all of a sudden you think, Hey, look, I'm bonded to my dog now. But then you wouldn't be able to describe it either. You'd be like, I don't know, man. I just like fucking went on some walks and, you know. You know, it's a look. It's like I look over and then they look back at me and I'm just like, oh. Um, yeah. You know, it's like, cool, man. You're, we're, we're present together. We're conducted. Like, yeah, it's an interesting thing. But, dude, I, um, how do people get a hold of you if they want to work with you? <laughs> and um, anything uh, else that... Do you want to touch on anything else? We've been talking for quite a, a little bit about a, a 20 to 20 more minutes to be two hours. Is there any, um, anything that I no. didn't touch on that you want to mention? Not necessarily. No. I mean, I mean, we, I'd like to do this again sometime. I think that maybe oh, like, uh, we both take some figure we'll process. This. Some, yeah. 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 Break, break it down. Break you know? it down. Yeah. We um, just met today. We just met earlier yeah. today. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and as far as like getting a hold of me, I mean, I'm on Facebook. You can look me up by my last name or my, my full name is down here. Uh, you can send me a message and I'll probably just send you my phone number. Uh, I've got a website for my dogs that I barely ever even touch anymore. Um, it's the Kessler family farms.com. Um, and then Honestly, the best way to get a hold of me is just to find me like on Facebook or Instagram and then just send me a message and I'll send you my phone number because I don't really do the whole like I do message back and forth like once I know you and stuff. But I like I like to just talk to people. Um, yeah. Let me see what the my website is again. Real quick. Yeah. yeah. And if anybody has any questions or anything, we got um... Kendra says, thank you both, y'all both. There you can tell. Thank y'all both. There we go. Where's she from? <laughs> you can tell the she's first from West, She's from West Texas. She's all in, in, in and all also she's in now. she's into archaeology too. So like that's why wow. she was um so yeah, it's Kesslerfamilyfarm.com. K-E-S-T-L-E-R Family Farm dot com. Very cool. I put it up in the comments. And then I'm also uh, on Instagram under Kessler Family Guardians. Kessler Family Guardians. It's like underscores between the words. 
Kessler underscore between the words family. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, dude. No, you're good, man. I'm far not fartian guardian. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, something's up with this. They're they're uh, sending out like misspelling vibes here. There we go. Nope. All right, man. Well, I I love this conversation. <clears throat> yeah, it was I look great. Forward to, yeah, we'll we'll continue this on, and um, yeah, we'll get more into. I want to I want to compile maybe maybe some stories from uh, from like ancient civilizations and. You know, just like I want to, I want to like how they would raise their dogs and what it, maybe a day in the life of, of somebody back then might look like. Um, I mean, there's people still doing it to this day, you know, in the in these mountain regions that are raising them exactly the same because they're just it's just part of life. So they're not really raising their dogs; they're just living their life. And so I'd be fantastic. totally down with that. Yeah, yeah. Just I mean, it's just how it is, you know. Teresa oh, just commented, I have loved this talk. I plan to be friends with Jason like you, Bill, felt the connection. Yes, indeed, man. Awesome. Yes. Thank you for making this happen there, Teresa. Yeah. Well, Jason, dude, uh, say, stay there. We'll say goodbye to everybody here, and then I'll say goodbye to you in the studio. So, In the studio, huh? Yeah, dude. The, the, the big, my $10 million studio. We'll be right back. <laughs> Thank right you, off. dude. Yeah, totally. I'll write it. I write 